Hey everybody, it's Josh from the Underground Garage. I'm gonna do a video today on the newest toy I added to the shop, a Dinojet 224 XLC. The Dinojet 224 is probably the most common dyno in America. I would say this is what most people are familiar with. This is a 24 inch steel drum. It can be mounted in the ground or it can be up out of the ground and you use a lift to pick the car up to put the tires on it. How it works, you drive your car on, you put the powered wheels on the dyno, you strap everything down and then you go wide open throttle in the car. The drum weighs about 3,000 pounds. So the dyno software, the computer running the dyno, will calculate how fast you can accelerate that 3,000 pound drum from wherever you start the pull to wherever you end the pull, from 30 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour, etc. So that's how it determines torque. It can calculate torque based on how quickly you can accelerate the 3,000 pound drum. If you give the dyno computer engine RPM, like a tachometer signal, it will also be able to calculate horsepower. So this will measure horsepower and torque as delivered to the tire, which is different than the horsepower and torque that the engine makes because you have to turn, you know, a transmission, drive shaft, rear end or front end, transaxle, that sort of thing. So all that stuff takes power to turn. So this is what is actually being put to the ground by the engine in the car. What makes this dyno a little different than most Dynojet 224s you'll see is the load control. That's the LC on the end of the part number. Most of them are a 224X. This is a 224X LC, LC load control. Over here, underneath these two vents, there's a large electronic brake. So it takes 220 volts. That's hooked to the drum. And what it allows you to do is add load, simulate a heavier drum. So why would you want to do that? Why would you want to simulate a heavier drum than the 3,000 pounds? Well, if your car, say your car weighs 4,000 pounds, the horsepower and torque numbers delivered by the drum without the brake will be accurate. However, if you're trying to tune the car, tune the engine to produce maximum power, maybe the timing, for example, the engine may tolerate more timing with a 3,000 pound load on it than it would going down the road with a 4,000 pound load from the car. So what this electronic brake allows you to do is add that extra load to simulate the load that the engine is going to see actually going down the road or going down the track, which is pretty cool. And so that's why I did that. I got this one because of the brake. I've also got this device. I got this with the dyno. This is an air fuel ratio meter uses just a conventional oxygen sensor right here. You take this guy, this little probe, jam it into the exhaust and it will measure the amount of oxygen in the exhaust and it will extrapolate an air fuel ratio from that. So that's a really good, good thing to have. Helps tremendously when trying to, trying to tune a car. There is quite a lot of cabling that goes along with the dyno. I've got all mine hung up over here. Run through them real quick. These two are RPM pickups. Uh, like I mentioned, if you can feed engine RPM to the computer that's running the dyno, the computer can calculate horsepower and torque as opposed to just torque. So that's what those are for. This one is the, they call it the pendant. This is what you'd have in the car as you were making a pull. You can use these buttons to control the dyno, tell it, I want to make a hit right now. I want you to apply the electronic brake. I want you to bring the drum to a stop, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this one here, this is a boost or vacuum sensor. So I can use the computer that is controlling the dyno to log boost, vacuum, anything in between. And the last one over here, this is a grounding cable. This was not gone over very well in the instructions that came with the dyno, but it ended up being really important the engine compartment on the car is an incredibly noisy environment from an electronic standpoint. There's a lot of things in there that give off an RF interference. You've got the alternator making noise, you've got injectors opening and closing, injector drivers, all kinds of stuff going on that makes noise. Well, that electronic noise will get into these data cables and mess up the data signal that you're trying to record. So you'll see weird things, the RPM, for example, will you be cruising along making a pull and the RPM will double for, for a split second or something dumb like that. 
That's RF interference getting into these data cables. Well, if you take this ground cable, you hook this to the negative battery post in the car, the other end hooks to the metal chassis on the dyno. The metal chassis on the dyno is actually hooked to the power grid in the building for ground. So all that interference is way more likely to run through this cable to that ground as opposed to getting into your data acquisition cables and giving you bum data. Like I said, that wasn't gone over very well in the instructions that came with the dyno, but after playing with it for a few weeks, a month or so, I kind of figured that out. So this was very important. So if you have a dyno, you're going somewhere with the dyno, and you're having those weird data hiccups, this is a, a good first step in trying to solve that. All right, when you open up the dyno control software, this is what you're gonna see. This is your basic gauge layout. It shows temperature in the room, that sort of thing. Uh, you can monkey with these gauges quite a lot. You can do, we'll go up here and hit data tools, go to edit mode. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. We're going to, uh, let's do, I don't know, we want to do one of these. And we can grab humidity, barometric pressure, all kinds of stuff. You can look at the drum acceleration, force, power, etc. Uh, one of the configurations that I use a lot, I've got saved up here is my gauge layout. And so this is booster vacuum, and this is also booster vacuum, just on a, a vertical gauge. Uh, air fuel ratio, I've got engine RPM, the speed of the dyno, real-time power, real-time torque, and then also the correction factor, the humidity, barometric pressure, and the temperature. So you can kind of see that stuff bouncing around a little bit as the dyno is looking at real time weather data here in the shop. This is what you're going to see after you make a pass on the dyno. Uh, you got torque is the slightly faded line and then power is the darker line. Uh, this was a centrifugal supercharged 1999 Corvette made 693, 605. And you can see right up here where the power did that, the belt on the blower started to slip a little bit. And so we lost some boost. Uh, so that's why the power went down. If the belt would have hung on, uh, it may have made, you know, 730, 750, somewhere in that range. Uh, the second graph down here is air fuel ratio. Let me do this. Uh, so you can see the air fuel ratio, pretty flat. Everything was pretty, pretty good there. Uh, one, one neat thing with that electronic brake, I'll just kind of show you guys. Let's do, come over here, you can change this to torque. So the electronic brake at 4,174 RPMs was adding 56 pounds of torque to the drum. As you accelerate, speed of the car, speed of the drum goes up. And so it's, it's adding torque to the drum, making the drum harder and harder and harder to turn, simulating the wind resistance of the car at speed. So if we change this one to speed, you can see at 100 miles an hour, there's an additional 57 pound-feet of torque being inputted to the drum to simulate the wind at 100 miles an hour. At 140, it's adding 189 pound-feet to the drum. And at 170, it's adding 285 pound-feet of drum. So if you didn't have that break, all, you're not going to get any of this extra resistance based on the mile an hour that the vehicle is theoretically traveling. So that's a really cool feature. I really like being able to put the load on the engine as it would be going down the road, as opposed to just the inertia associated with accelerating the drum. So what are my thoughts on the dyno in general? Uh, I'm very happy with it. It does everything that I wanted it to do. Really the only negatives are the lack of instruction associated with the software, uh, working through that software, figuring all that stuff out, there's really none of that covered in the instructions. 
a lot of what DinoJet does is motorcycle or ATV based. So a lot of the stuff in the software is specific to that, which doesn't apply to me because I'm doing cars and trucks and stuff. Uh, and then tire spin on the drum. That's another one that every once in a while, depending on how you strap the car down, how much power it makes, that sort of thing, uh, it will spin the tires, do like a burnout on the drum as you're trying to make a pull. I've been able to overcome that with changing the way I strap the car down. I have never had one that I couldn't dyno because it kept spinning the tires, uh, but I'm sure that day will come. So for the most part though, I am extremely happy with it. I got, I got a pretty good deal on it. I bought it brand new from DinoJet. Uh, the dyno was 19,500 and then adding the electronic brake to it was another 15 grand. So I'm into it for about $35,000, dollars which is an enormous chunk of change to spend on a dyno, especially for somebody like me who's not doing it as a business. I'm not making money off the dyno. It's just for me and my buddies to fuck around on. But it, it's a lot of fun. So it's been neat. I don't feel ripped off or anything like that. So if you're considering the dyno jet 224, especially the XLC with the load control, my opinion is, is go for it. So that's all I got. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.